Hello, hello everyone. So excited for today's panel. I am joined by incredible panelists here today. We have <laughs> artists from the Re Encuentro and we have artists nationally. We are on the East Coast, West Coast and in between. <laughs> And I'm so thrilled and grateful to have these fantastic folks in discussion today. Um, our discussion is called Pathway to Healing, Processing Grief and Trauma Through Artistic Expression. And I can't imagine better folks to have this discussion. So let's kick it off with some introductions. My name is Amelia Acosta Powell. I use, I use she, ella pronouns, pronouns, pronouns. Uh, and um, I am on the selection committee of the Re Encuentro, so I had the distinct pleasure of seeing all of these pieces on their journeys, and I'm so grateful to the Latino Theater Company for hosting this incredible event and to all the artists who are a part of it. Um, I'd love if we can go around, um, and so maybe I can start us off um, I don't know if all of our boxes look the same. So uh, maybe I'll kick it to Mei, Mei and we can popcorn it around. For sure. What's up? My name is Mei, Mei Garcia. I go by they or a pronouns. Um, I'm uh, currently streaming in from the occupied territory of the Duwamish in Seattle, Washington. And originally I'm from El Salvador on the lands of the uh, Lincoln people. Um, and I'm an actor and a playwright. Um, my Playhouse of Sueños came out earlier this year. It's an adaptation of Hamlet that deals with um, suicide and suicide loss, as well as legacy burden and intergenerational trauma, specifically focused on a, like a bicultural family from El Salvador and from the United States. So I'm super pumped to be here. This is like a dream. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I'll pass it along to Frankie. Hi everyone, my name is Frankie Duval Gonzalez. I'm a playwright and uh, sometimes producer when it comes to my own work uh, and the performer of uh, Paletas de Coco, which is here at the Reencuentro. Uh, I am over a, just north of Dallas, Texas on the unceded lands of the Wichita people. Uh, and I'm just very excited to be here. Uh, my play also explores uh, a bit of a, uh, you know, suicidal ideation, suicidology, and uh, as well as just how to figure out the re rethinking of fatherhood when father was a bad word all your life after you've become a father of having been abandoned by your father. Um, so that's Paletas de Coco in a nutshell. And there's Christmas Eve and, and Coconut Popsicles. So that's that's there too. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll pass it over to uh, Guadalice. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Guadalice Del Carmen. My pronouns are she, hers, ella. Um, I'm a playwright, screenwriter. Um, co-artistic director of the Latinx Playwright Circle, um, a million other things. <laughs> um, I am currently in New York City, the land of the Lenape. My family is from Dominican uh, Republic, originally the land of the Tainos, and the original site of where the first enslaved Africans were taken. So I'm a direct descendant of the, those lineages. Um, and I'm also very excited to be here and be in conversation with you all. Um, I'm going to pass it over to Maritz Maritzel. Yes, <laughs> I feel my heart is beating. I feel so excited. <laughs> uh, my name is Maritza Carrero. I am actress and producer of the play movie called Calle de la Resistencia, which is streaming here in Encuentro. 
very happy to be here. I'm in the traditional lands of the Tonga people. And I also claim my Taino ancestry, um, very much present in my life as, a, as an artist, as a healer, as a human being. And um, yeah, my play deals with the trauma that the Puerto Rican community experienced after the Hurricane Maria and uh, all the corruption and just the negligence that was the aftermath of, of Maria and how uh, the governments did not take care of the people. And so our movie deals with that and also the reclaiming of the power that happened two years later at Calle de la Resistencia where people demonstrated and got the governor to resign. If folks have not already seen these two pieces that are part of the Encuentro, Calle de la Resistencia and Paletas de Coco are both available. Um, and I cannot encourage you enough to watch these pieces. They are moving, they are powerful, they're fantastic works of art and also of humanity. Um, and just to also shout out Meme's piece, House of Sueños that they mentioned. Um, Guadalice has a, an incredible, well, actually has a host of incredible plays also dealing with these topics. Um, and if you have a chance to see any of any of her plays, but I was specifically gonna say that Guadalice's play Beats and Honey is like one of my favorite plays. So please everyone follow all of these artists I wanna kick off our discussion actually taking us back. I wanna ask each of you about how the arts has been a healing force in your life. How have you experienced witnessing art and making art as actually a tool that you have used in your healing or in your personal journey to access your humanity and create a better condition for your life? Go for it, Frankie. <laughs> You're making those faces. Um, for me, the arts have been everything in terms of being able to express who I am and, and um, how I, I can exist in this world. Uh, it was one of those things that the thing that would keep the noises that my father would make quiet were the books or the music, um, whether it was all hip hop records, salsa records, whatever it may be, um, getting it on a Walkman and just sitting there and, and the noise would drown out because of art. Um, to be able to go to a museum and see uh, paintings where even as a kid, I was just like, that guy Jackson Pollock made that? I can do that. Uh, you know, <laughs> It, 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 for me, provided this way out, and it also provides me the opportunity to grieve um, in, in place of traditional methods, which I always encourage, always seek therapy and everything. But when I couldn't afford it, art was my therapy. Art was how I, how I dealt with things. Art was how I made sense of the fact that virtually all of the men of my family were, were in prison. Um, art was how I made sense of my own depression and my own relationship with it. And art is now guiding me and helping me through navigating the challenges that come with fatherhood, um, not knowing what fatherhood actually is or a good example of it, I should say. So it, it to me is, is um, the kind of access by which I, I navigate my life is, is through the arts. I can say for me, art has been a way of understanding life better. I, I've always been very, very conscious of how impermanent life is and how short this life really is. It's something I think about constantly. It's, it's very present in my reality. And so for me, art has helped me understand the mysticism of life, understand uh, my my family understand my own history. It has given me a, a way of creating beauty and magic in places where I don't see beauty and magic. And I think that's important because it has kept my soul young 
and it has given me an opportunity to give to others as well. And in that giving, also receiving that love and and that um, appreciation for life. Um, maybe we'll, we'll, I don't want to talk too much, but I, as an actress, as a performer of theater, I, I love theater and theater has always been uh, a place that has gotten me closer to my own divinity. I have learned how to surrender to the expression of divinity and the art to surrender. I have learned how to make fear my my good friend, <laughs> my good friend that guides me. I I have learned to reclaim my own history and in different ways that maybe we later will share. And I have learned that I'm not a victim of my surroundings or what anything that happens to me or to my people. You know, I didn't, um, I wasn't really raised around art or like with art. I really came into it just as a, like as a nerd uh, and as something that, I mean, in my, in El Salvador, like they just rebuilt the Teatro Nacional because the war, the war is pretty recent. I mean, recent as in, I suppose, it's still, it still is actually going on in a way. Um, so art has always seen in my home country as like a luxury that we just could never really afford. And so growing up kind of both here and there, my pathway through it was just that I was really weird and I never really felt like I fit in anywhere other than doing plays with other weirdos. Um, and <laughs> I and then ultimately, yeah, I'm like, we're all weird here. Um, and then, you know, but I did grow up like my dad, like I think really recognized um, that the arts were a place that like radicals lived in. And my Salvadoran family very much exists in the radical um, guerrilleros world. And so like I grew up with a lot of poetry. I grew up with a lot of um, like watching old films and stuff. And, and my dad had Shakespeare in Spanish that he would read to me when I was a child. Mm -hmm. um, and so like I kind of I, I was always like inundated in it, I suppose. And then I just got like, I think really just selfish and just greedy. And I was like, I just want to do it all. And I really loved the feeling of power that I had when I would perform and when I would write um, and just being this like, you know, chubby Salvadoran kid in the middle of nowhere, Washington, <laughs> where really like no one really got what I was trying to throw down. Um, but all of a sudden I had everyone's attention and everyone was listening to me and you know, I could like fight and be epic and, you know, at the age of 12, woo, woo people or whatever, that it was something that I always felt um, incredibly uh, like powerful in. Um, and then as I grew older, I started realizing that the roles that I wanted to play, like I've always wanted to play Hamlet and no one would cast me as Hamlet. So then I was like, well, I'll just do my own version of Hamlet where it's my whole family. And uh we're just as kind of as royal as this weird Danish prince that people are obsessed with. Um, but instead we make it about Salvadorans um, and Cipotes. Um, but so yeah, like art I guess has always been the place where I feel the most authentically myself and the most I think liberated. Um, and as a queer person in all of the ways in terms of being weird and also gender and sexuality, it's also the place that I feel in the way like the most neutral um, that I'm encouraged to just operate from like what my heart is wants in that moment rather than um, what I'm told to be or who I'm told to be. So, um, I think for me, uh, art has been a process, uh, which I mean, we can all say like, yeah, there's a process to art, but I feel like art has served me in different ways in different uh, moments in my life. Um, I mean, as a kid, I had amazing teachers who were always very supportive of me writing and writing really helped me process my feelings about who mm -hmm. I was and how I fit in the world and, um, you know, not being surrounded by other people that looked or sounded like me and just being able to channel that through the pen was, you know, something that's really powerful for a child. And then getting older, um, a lot of the theater that I began doing was actually with, you um, revolutionary Puerto Ricans that were very much mm -hmm. loud and proud about, you know, the Puerto Rican community and independistas and doing work that was, you know, 
to serve what it meant to be Puerto Rican and, you know, still live under colonialist power. So a lot of my enlightenment uh, around myself as an artist and even artivism and what that means came from the work that I did early on with, with those theater troops in Humble Park in Chicago. Um, and so I feel like that really was a catalyst for me in how I moved through the world and how I would be able to interpret things. And as I continued writing, there was then this process of kind of going more inward and really figuring out who I was as a person and as a human being and where I came from and also connecting with my ancestors, something that was very new to me in many ways because of how I was raised, you know, religion and all of that. Um, so that for me was a process in of itself and grieving, you know, mm -hmm. the oppression that my ancestors felt and even my own oppression as a woman, as a black woman, as a black Latina, as, you know, all these different intersectionalities. So for me, art is something that is ever evolving within my life and kind of serves me in so many different ways. Um, it has also been a huge way for me to create, find, form community, which is something that I've always felt mm -hmm. is something that I needed as a human being. Beautiful. Thank you all. I think um, you've raised such interesting points already because all the different kind of words or terms or aspects we're talking about have different meanings for different it, for different people in different ways, right? Healing, there's not one, there's not one way, there's not one form of what healing looks like. Grief, there's not one idea of grief. Art, right? These are all um, areas where they're subject to interpretation. And I think I can relate to something what everyone has said. I'm so grateful for your, your openness and your vulnerability. Oh, it's going to be a good, good conversation. <laughs> I'm curious, you know, each of you talked about some areas that you have processed uh, grief, trauma, difficult aspects of your lives in your art. And I'm curious if there is an approach that you have or practices that you have that you're willing to share for really um, finding that line between processing or engaging that space and also taking care of yourself and making sure that you're okay in that process. Because I think it can be, I think we can, when we bring our full selves to our art, it's vulnerable. It, it creates a space, even, even just as a witness to these pieces, it creates a space that is so beautiful and so healing and can also be very hard. Mm -hmm. So what are some of those practices for you? I think that the art, or I believe, I'll, I'll speak for myself, I believe that the art that you are attracted to, or either as a writer, or like you're attracted to write, or the place that you're attracted to perform, or even the jobs that come at you that you say yes to, they come for a reason. I have always found in my work connections to where I am in my life and where I can grow. And maybe that's my way of finding purpose, uh, maybe, but it has been really beautiful uh, in my life as a performer and in all kinds of art that I have done, but specifically in theater. I think theater definitely has, a, there's a magic to it that, that allows that. I, I think, so, so I think that if it comes to you, you, it, you have something to learn. And so it's about opening up and saying, okay, I have it in front of me. Sometimes healing happens and you know it's happening and sometimes you don't know it ha it's happening until you observe it from the outsider and then say oh it's happening it has happened so for me i i'm able to the things i i've used to cope is basically what is what is the learning what is it that i that i have to do what is it that i have to go through and take it i always have taken it as a sort of without being precious but sort of like a, a spiritual practice in this work, what do I need to learn to take myself and take this art to the next level and remove myself from it? Because I think the trap is to think that it's about you, but it never is about you. 
It's about whatever it is that you're trying to, to convey, whether it's as a performer, the words of someone else, or whether it's your own words, like Frankie has done, or what Alice does. And then it's about the soul. What does the soul want to get out? What does the ancestry want to get out through my art or the art of everyone else that we're, is here? I think um, the process that I go through with creating art resembles a sort of um, interrogation of myself. And in order to be able to properly interrogate myself and my own flaws as I try to explore how I'm repeating the mistakes of my father in the way that he repeated his father's mistakes is to be at peace with what, whatever decision or whatever result comes out of the interrogation. And I have to make a conscious choice to make sure that if anyone's going to be put in a bad light, it's got to be myself because I can only speak for me. I don't know the fullness of the experience of another person. For all the terrible things that my father may have done to me, I also know that he went through horrendous things in Colombia. He went through horrible things in New York. Um, and I, I can't put him too harshly because I don't know the full spectrum and range of, of what he's gone through. So for me, I always have to approach any personal work that deals with my, my sense of grief or my sense of trying to heal and say, Whatever it comes to, you have to be ready for the result that comes out. And you might not like the result that comes out. Um, you might not be happy with it. You might even realize that you're becoming the monster. And um, so I, I, I take very, very careful pains to make sure that oftentimes I'll be alone on a writer's retreat when I decide to go on that journey. Or I'll find a place that I can be away from family because I don't want anyone to be in that kind of psychic space around me as I'm doing that interrogation. And so for me, it is a very almost uh, monastic solitude um, that I that I take on and I explore those things. And then when I come out of it, I'm what I make sure I do is I don't write for a, a long time. Um, I don't usually, after Paletas de Coco, I did not write a word for about three months. There was no there was no writing no more because I, I had to just really live with it, live in that space and really think about it itself, because at the end of the day, um, and this may this may sound like something that uh, will be problematic to, to some, but um, I don't care about myself enough truly to really want to do any of the work, but I care about my son enough to know that I have to do the work or else I'm going to hurt him the way I was hurt. Mm -hmm. And I need to do this, if not for myself, I need to do it to make sure that, that mi hijo is happy, that my wife is, is happy, that she doesn't go through these horrible things that my mother was put through, that my grandmother was put through uh, by the men of, of by the, the, the patriarchal line of, of my, my family. So it is, it is one of those things, I have to be at peace and I'm doing it for someone else um, because frankly, I've, I've not yet reckoned enough with my own sense of, of depression and self-loathing to be able to say, I'm doing this for me. I'm doing this for me so that I can do it for someone else. Um, I have to do it because I, or else it's not going to solve itself. So I, that's how I approach art. It has to be alone though. I can't like, I can't write it like in my house. I can't do it. I have to be away. I'll, I'll, I'll go somewhere. It, even if it's in like the woods or something, I'll do it alone. I've been thinking a lot about, um, I'm just going off of what what um, Frankie was saying about how I feel like I write a lot about the fact that there's all this pressure I feel like on 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 us on like the artists because I'm the one who is responsible for stopping the trauma in any kind of way stopping the trauma of my father the trauma my whole family experience in El Salvador even the trauma that my mother experienced like it's my responsibility to kind of be the linchpin that holds everything together. And I remember after I wrote House of Sueños, I like actually for the first time in my life found a therapist and my therapist listened to the story because it came out as a podcast. Um, and she was telling me, she was like, wow, you know, I don't, I think if you, if you hadn't written this play, like you never would have come to therapy. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot about this idea of like that we have this pain or this grief or this trauma that we have to in a way purge really from ourselves, from our, from our family lineage that at some point it has to stop 
with us. Um, and so moving forward now, you know, House of Sueños really helped me, but in the other plays I've written, um, I kind of have tried as much as I can to partner with counselors or therapists because a lot of the plays that I write deal really intensely with my own mental health challenges and the challenges of those people, the people in my family. Um, and just providing like resources and really just kind of like putting it out there from the very, very beginning because it wasn't something that I grew up really knowing was important or even understanding what mental health was or the effects mm -hmm. of it. And even like the some, something like intergenerational trauma, which is something I heard for the first time like three years ago, maybe. And mm -hmm. like just kind of seeing that like intergenerational trauma like sits in the body, like it's physicalized. Mm -hmm. Um, and that I think that a way for me to not only to remove the physicalization from my body is by writing. Um, and so, so yeah, I'm really collaborating with therapists and with my, my therapist, Mari, if you're watching, you're great. Um, but, uh, but yeah, that's, that's my piece. Yeah. Just kind of listening to everyone. Um, and Frankie, thank you for sharing um, that I think Paleta de Coco does a really beautiful job of beginning to break, you know, some of those cycles. Um, so I just want to give you a virtual hug. Um, but uh, I had a, a, a really good friend and spiritual guide tell me ancestors know who they pick when they pick them. Mm -hmm. And at, for me, my process has been one where I've been trying to figure out what my process is. And I, I feel like recently I've surrendered to what feels the most natural and the most organic to me. Um, I think those of us that are raised um, in very Western traditional norms try to conform ourselves into the Western way of doing art. And for mm -hmm. me, the, the journey has really been rediscovering my ancestral ways of doing art and doing theater because Theater is something that has been with us for centuries, way longer than Shakespeare started writing, you know? Um, so I, I try to practice a lot of kindness and grace with myself, especially when it's writing really heavy pieces. Um, and for me, I do a lot of dreamscaping and it's something that I learned from my seventh grade teacher. Um, she used to settle down uh, my very rowdy class by <laughs> having us uh, close our eyes and imagine ourselves going to go get ice cream. And when you really think of what it means for children in certain communities that might not have, you know, the financial resources to actually get things, to have a teacher allow you to dream, mm -hmm. like that goes really deep. So that's something that has stayed with me and I have surrendered to that, uh, to dreamscaping and to allow myself to um, imagine imagine myself and the worlds that I want to create beyond what you know the Western ideals of doing theater. I think for me, it's also really important in discovering what are the ways that you know we do theater outside of of the U.S. And you know, I've had so many conversations with different artists. And it's always like, well, how do I find like the key to like having a successful play or even a successful film or TV show? And it's like, I just feel like so many of us um, already have the keys within us. And it's a matter of like figuring out the ways to tap into into that. Um, and for me, it really is a thing of I approach things with curiosity and then I allow myself to to dream. It, it sounds corny as shit, I know, but... <laughs> <laughs> well, visualization, you're talking about visualization, you're talking yeah. about like hypnotherapy, you're talking about, I mean, to me, I have, I would not, never be able to be on stage and if I did not really, med meditation, for example, is something, hypnotherapy, releasing your fears, I used to be extremely, I mean, terrified to be on stage. And I thought, oh my God, why did I pick this career if I'm so terrified? Like I'm talking about terror, terror. And it was, that's why I say it gave me an opportunity to see fear as a friend and say, okay, you're there to help me. You want to try to protect me. I see you. 
you know, I see you here and I have my words here and I see the audience and ultimately this is a human experience and I'm going to open up to it and I'm going to fail maybe. <laughs> but if I don't open up myself to the possibility, I'm just going to be a talking head <laughs> forever and ever. And, and that risk taking, and I think really hypnotherapy, I think that's what you're talking about, or visualization, the, the, the ability to imagine something that doesn't exist, or seeing yourself before you experience the moment that you're trying to create, seeing yourself there, I think for me too has been really valuable. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think it can be like seen as, uh, you know, dreamscaping can take on many forms. Uh, it, it, it can be meditating, absolutely. But I just kind of let my mind take me where it wants to go. And I, Maricel, you said something really lovely earlier about, you know, connecting spiritually. And for me, that really is what it feels like. Because, you know, sometimes it's like things will come and I'm like, ¿Dónde rayo vino eso? You know? and like, <laughs> yeah, it's coming from somewhere. You have a channel there. But you, you're you allowing yourself to kind of go on that journey. And and that's, you know, for me, dreamscaping is a, is a, it, it's a it's a mental journey, but it's just so much deeper than that. And the curiosity kind of allows me to keep going on that to figure out what the story is. And sometimes not every story that I find on my dreamscape journey is a story for me to tell anyone. It's it's it could sometimes just be a story that I just need to know right. for myself and keep for myself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you all for sharing those those. Um, processes are so personal, but they're also so collective. And I think that specifically in theater, right, it's even if you write, even if like Frankie, you write off alone in the woods, ultimately it is a collective experience theater, but not every part of the process is. And I think that's, I think it's so important that we have space for that imagination, that, that journey, that some parts of which are private and then you know, the, the vulnerable parts that you're willing to share in that public space, I think are really, really brave. I'm curious about, you know, some of the um, specific examples, like what Frankie and Meme were sharing are very much from the personal and the individual perspective. When we talk about a piece like Calle de la Resistencia, we're talking about a collective trauma that, that affected effects, I should say, in the present tense, so many people. And what, what, if any, differences are there for you as a creator in terms of like processing collective trauma or art that actually speaks to a community's pain? Yeah, I think it's, it's definitely a challenge. And I also question whether, um, what we are doing is helping or how I could actually help, not just um, for it to be um, a, a way of, expo you know, of, of bringing the conversation to the table so that we can see ourselves and see our strength at the same time. Um, but also how can we move it forward to the next level? That's where I'm at. I feel like because we've been through this process um, I am now sort of, like I said, being able to see it from the outside. And I know that, for example, during our time, um, there were people in our cast that experienced Maria. And the reason that why they're here is because of Maria or the, the hurricane. And there were very, very fresh wounds there. And also people that I spoke to after doing the, 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 you know, the play and they saw the movie and it feels like a like a huge responsibility and it also feels like how i constantly think about this you know okay personally i would like to show the strength of my people to to everyone i want people to acknowledge the strength of my people right and i also feel like i would love through the music for them to to have a little bit of a caress in that soul like say you know i'm here this art is for me, it's for me to, to heal a little bit. But I don't wanna negate the reality. The reality is traumatic, it's depressive, it's a tragedy that is still very much present. And so it's on one side, the beauty of it, so that you can see yourself and say, wow, look at what I've been through. But I, on the other side, I don't want our people to continue to be resilient. I don't, I don't 
want them to need to be that resilient. I want them to like take a break. <laughs> and, and so I am searching right now in my mind and in my soul, what are ways in which we can use this movie to create some, some real change um, and that could be fun, you know, fundraising for people. It could be presenting it in in different schools. It could be I don't know what that means, um, but definitely using it as a tool. Absolutely, I think it. it I think the at the very minimum, the empathy that it creates if you are someone who did not live that experience is powerful. And if it doesn't galvanize people to action. I don't know what will, to be honest, it's a, it beautifully captures. Um, Thank you. That we that we must act, absolutely, yeah, yeah. I, I am curious, you know, we don't necessarily finish our experience with a, a work of art mm -hmm. when, we, when we leave the room or when the movie's over, right? I, I watch these pieces that each of you, uh, the, the works of art I've seen from each of you, and they still live with me, even if I heard it, saw it, experienced it mm -hmm. weeks, months, years ago. And um, I think what you're speaking about, about the importance of kind of that next step is, so we make the piece and then what, right? The art doesn't leave us when we leave the room. Mm -hmm. And uh, what are your thoughts? What is What are your dreams for the future of your works of art? what does what happens next mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and that can be as a as the audience or the participants are walking out of the room it can be years down the line but what do what do you, you all hope what can we create i think there's i mean for me i'm always interested when bringing a piece to a theater what how the community can be wrapped up within the work um in a way that how the community can participate um, and be allowed to have conversations. I know some people have, you know, have feelings or talkbacks, but I think that, you know, talkbacks that are curated in a way that allows like a real integration of the work itself and, you know, the audience is a really beautiful way of kind of processing the journey that just happened. Um, mm -hmm. I I, uh, I saw Alicia Harris's What to Send Up um, a couple times here in New York City. Um, and the pieces in and of itself is, is one of my favorite works of theater. Um, and the end, at the end, it's there's a moment where it's like everyone who is um, black uh, is, is given space to grieve together. And that to me is one of the most beautiful expressions of taking care of you know, of an audience, especially after watching a piece that kind of puts the 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 black experience in front and center. And I think, I think for those of us that are writing works that kind of puts our journeys, especially our our oppressive journeys, front and center, really creating a care um, around the artists um, and as and the audience as well is super important. And that is through talkbacks. That is you know, parties like the pain can't can't come without the joy like the pain and the joy have to kind of work together in a way where it is able to fully serve the human right and i don't i don't think any of us can walk around in just joy without some pain because then we wouldn't know what joy is if we don't have pain and vice versa and i think that our art has to kind of also be reflective of that and and for me just because of the theaters that I work with and I'll, you know, shout out um, urban theater company in Chicago, the way that, that, that urban theater does art is feels to me as a very holistic way. Cause it's not just taking care of making sure that the art is being done. It's also like, how do we include the community into this conversation and serve the community in a way that you really don't see in a lot of theaters. I know for myself, I am not a fan of the Western theatrical tradition of resolution. Uh, I don't like the bow. I don't like the idea of the straight happy ending or the straight sad ending. Um, and sometimes I even don't like ambiguous endings. Um, an ending is fine, but that there is still an openness to it. I think that for my own 
play process and the plays that I'm exploring and developing right now, um, one of the things that always left me embittered about seeing father and son movies or father and son shows was that it resolved itself as if it's so easy, that forgiveness is so simple, as, as if it's one moment and then that's it, it's, it's done. You're free from it. You're never free from it. You're never truly done with it. The, the, the story does not end simply because one moment has passed. It's just that moment and it keeps going. And what I try to do in terms of making sure that my audience, which I'm, I'm hoping are people who might be going through the same things I am, will feel is that I hope they make it when they look at my characters and say, I hope they make it. Um, at the end of Paletas de Coco, spoilers for whoever hasn't seen it, I make another bet and I, I leave open the possibility that I could mess up with my son. I could mess up in the most hor horrific way like my father messed up with me. And so I set another bet with myself and I'll leave them. And I, what I hope to accomplish with things like that is saying, it's not over, it's not done. Just because the story is over doesn't mean that the journey is done. It's just a chapter. And I want to leave people feeling like, okay, I can keep going on this journey too because I see that this person's journey is still going. And maybe they'll follow up. Maybe they'll you know, talk to each other. And maybe they'll be willing to talk about the ongoing journey. You are never truly past your grief. You're never truly past um, things like addiction. You're never, but you can follow up with people when you know it's a journey, when you acknowledge that it's not just, I'm free of it all. It's gone. Yeah. No, it, unfortunately that's, that's Hollywood's lies. Um, and the way that I hope that my scripts are going, and I don't know if it's accomplishing it or not, is to leave that ending open and see that the journey is still going and show them that we're all on this journey. I didn't solve the problem, but we're working toward it. Let's go together. Let's keep in touch. Um, and let's let's try our best, um, even when we make mistakes. Uh, that's how I, I want to approach creating theater. Um, I don't want just the bow tie. I don't the, the little bow on the on the on the present. No, that's that that doesn't matter to me. I want something that people will acknowledge that's realistic. Um, even in the surrealism of it it's still realistic that conclusion well i think you're being brave as well like you're being extremely brave with what you did frankie i don't know of any work that i i, I can't even imagine anything that for example my previous generation my father would have been able to see like what you did that openness and vulnerability to to share your your pain it, the way it is, I, I've never really seen, I want to see more of that. I want to see more stories about the, the, the relationship between man and man and the, the vulnerability that lives inside of there. I know that my father would have loved to have some example of that. I feel really happy that, that we are getting there, that we're getting to see. It's important to see you go through that uncomfortable vulnerability because you are giving us the opportunity also to go there with you in, in you know, for me, might mean one thing, for, but it's, it's relatable. Thank you. Yeah. And, and like you said, there, there was one part that I was so sad that it had to get cut from the 60 minute version that I presented that um, I really want back in where, I had to wrestle with the fact that perhaps I'm not as vulnerable as my father is in the way that you're discussing. My father had a horrible, my grandfather was horribly abusive, worse than my father ever did to me. And when we found out he passed away, my father wept and was holding me for like 30 minutes and then actually prayed for his soul um, and said, and you know, was telling God, I forgive him, please just let him get to heaven. Um, and that level of forgiveness, I actually had to interrogate within myself. And I and I tell, by extension, my son, I don't think I got that in me, man. I don't think I could pray for his soul. I, I'm, mm. He might be better than me. He might be. And I, I want that honesty out there because I know I cannot be the only one who's thinking these things. I know I cannot be the only one who lives in that kind of place and that's working to try to get past it. Um, but we are very afraid because we see ourselves as the protagonist of our own stories. We'll find any excuse. And I don't want to make excuses anymore because my son deserves better than excuses because all my father gave me was that. 
Um, and I'm not going to do that to him. And then that's touching a little bit of Melissa Dupre wrote about the cycles of trauma. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, for example, a, a movie like Calle la Resistencia, and I'm I'm sure Milton has more, much more to say than I do, but a movie like Calle la Resistencia wouldn't happen without the support of unseen forces that want the story to, to get out there. And I and I think the healing started way before we did the production. It is to me it's ancestral, it, it, it's mystical, it's um, the genealogy of the soul, like where we are, where is our soul now in relationship to our history? Like the Taino inside of me, I'll give you a story, a little one. Can I give you a little story? Okay. I was um, doing a play in um, the story, uh, um, uh, it was an opera and I had to do, one of the monologues I had to do was the story of Chief Tecum. Um, Chief Tecum, a, a Quiche leader uh, of, of the Mayan people, and how the conquistador, Don Pedro de Alvarado, um, they uh, genocide, complete genocide, right? At the end of that story, it ends with the monologue saying how Don Pedro de Alvarado had to acknowledge the beauty of the Quetzal Indian and tell all its soldiers, look, Look, it took three hours to kill this man, and he only has a cell, you know, he only has, they have guns, they don't have gunpowder. When he kills Chief Tecum, he says, soldiers, look, the beauty of the Quetzal India. I did that. He had to show them the beauty. This is the poetry, right, of the piece. As an actress, right, reading, doing the, the specificity of the research that we talked about in the previous panels, uh, the pain was very much there. The pain of understanding, wow, this is what happened during colonization. Colonization is not just a word, right? It's like all these events that are, like someone said, I think it was Meme that you said, they're in my body because they have moved through time. I am a body, but there's other bodies that have moved through time. With the, And I, I carry whether I want it or not, whether I'm conscious of it or not. And in that moment in time, so we, we did the performance first in Russia, then in Spain. And in some moment, I was doing the performance and I looked front of me. I was inside of the Teatro Real in Madrid, who was commissioned for Isabel II, Segunda. And I, my Taino person inside of me for a split second said, oh my God, if I go back to my Taino ancestry, all these years back, I am here now, 2013. This little girl in the middle of the Teatro Real that represents the monarchy, that represents colonization that represents all the people that, that hurt my people. What is my Taino woman saying inside of me? Yes, I am reclaiming my culture. I am reclaiming my power. I saw it that way. And I feel like, I don't know, it sounds very, it's, you know, big, big and, but to me, that's what that was. Cycles, the cycles of trauma, little healings that we're able to do. And sometimes it's like this, and sometimes it's, like you say, my mother, this is what happens to her and I can see it. And we are the artists. We are the ones that in a way are called to do it because we are the ones that have the sensitivity, the vulnerability, the capacity to expand our hearts and hurt deeply. And we are, como se dice, masoquista suficiente. We are, uh, como se dice, we are, it's a little bit of masochism, but to, for, for the good, because we, we, we want to understand what our, our human reality and our human reality is, is filled, unfortunately, with, with trauma, but it's also filled with the possibility of healing. So I go back to saying the healing starts before. And there's one thing I do that I might want to share. I do this every time I perform, I, I work on anyone, with anyone, any per, per, group of people, whatever, the op oponopono, where you go, I'm sorry, I forgive you, I love you. I do that with every single person that I am going to meet in the company, in the production, whatever. Because you know what? You never know how we're tied up. We are in this weave. We are in this, you know, we're woven together. We're not so, so separate from each other. I don't know what I am in your life, really. I don't know if you, I'm the teacher or, or I'm the student or I am the, the monster or the victim. <laughs> I don't know. It's bigger than, than this. It, this is how I think, obviously. I'm giving you my lens, my perspective. Um, but that is theater. 
We are called to do it because we are courageous enough to open up, feel the, the pain, to then transform it. Yes, beautifully said. And you, it might be some masochism, but it's also service. I think it's, I want to express gratitude because it's the opening up that you're describing, that sharing, that making of ourselves as artists vulnerable to tell story, that is service. I know that is one of the few things I feel like I know. I know it does good in this world. I know it's done good for me to speak from my perspective. I know it's done good for me to to take in the art and to participate in making art. and. I just believe that in my heart. So just to reframe, if there's masochism there too, maybe there is. <laughs> I like service better. <laughs> but it's true, it is service. After all, that's what we do. Absolutely. I think we have a, a number of people watching. So if you do have questions that you wanna put in the chat or in the comments, please put those in there and we will raise the, those for this panel. Um, as you're, as you're putting your comments in, I, I know that um, we started to go down this path. I wanna just ask about what, what's our care of duty for, our, for each other? What's our responsibility? That word was brought up. To be Respons honest. No, that's all I, I thought no one, I'm just honesty. <laughs> that's, that's true. I mean, you know, I, a lot of my stories that I write are horror stories. Like I specialize in horror and um, terror and frights and stuff, which is ironic because I have a bat above my bed. Um, but I think that there's, and I work a lot with this uh, choreographer in Seattle, Aliche Gossier, and uh, Aliche talks about um, that there's pain and then there's uncomfortable, being uncomfortable. And that we should always push ourselves not to experience pain, but to experience uncomfortability, as, as she calls it. And I think about that in terms of, you know, people go and they watch movie, they watch horror movies all the time and they love it. And they sit and they consume it. And there's a whole franchise dedicated to slashers, to thrillers, to um, suspense. And I think that there's that that type, there's that need in us to kind of vanquish and banish ghosts. And I think that we have a responsibility as as artists and as audience goers to kind of challenge ourselves and to engage in material that that might seem scary in some kind of way. Um, mm -hmm. But ultimately, it's just a human experience that we get to witness. Um, and I also think that as a playwright, one thing that I try really hard to as well is to really listen to my actors. When we were doing House of Sueños, I mean, at the end of Hamlet, I'm not going to spoil any, anything for anybody, but everybody dies. <laughs> everybody, the whole stage is filled with dead people. Uh -huh. um, and I was working with people who I really, really love and I really, really trust. And they were playing both myself and my sister and my dad and my mom and all these people in my life. And it was also the, the one of the darkest points of the pandemic. And we had all been inside for forever and our family members have been sick. And I've just had a lot of family members in Salvador get sick. And it just was a really uncertain time. And the death was really kind of adding up and I rewrote the ending, um, but I wish obviously I agree too, Frank, I, I don't like resolutions or happy endings or anything, but you frequently get that in horror, I think as a way to like, just kind of alleviate, you watch Midsommar and you're like, great at the end, everything's kind of okay. But, um, and I was just looking at the two actors who were playing my, me and my sister and I went back and I just rewrote it and I came back and it was a happier ending where both of us kind of, both of the characters lived in a way. And I just remember them just like crying. <laughs> and they were like, thank you so much for, for writing this because I don't think I could have, I don't think I could have made it through if, if the sisters had not lived just because of everything that was going on. And so I think just thinking about everyone's trauma and the context of trauma, both as the playwright and the play that you're writing and the characters and the actors that you're working with. And that's something that I've been trying to kind of channel. I think for me, in terms of being careful, um, this show specifically, Paletas, had an iteration where they were multi-characters. And one of the things that I was realizing is I was taking performers in through this world that I'd gone through and I was not taking care of them in that. Um, 
And at the same time, I was also um, being rather selfish with placing the burden of um, this story on people without them knowing because there was an element, there was an experimental element of the show where an actor would be on stage with me and not know anything about the show and have to read a letter at the end. Um, and it, I came to the ultimate realization that that wasn't taking care of anyone. Um, and luckily we were able to get that version out and I realized, no, it's not, it's not working. Uh, because what I ultimately want to do in my attempt to care for everyone is I don't want to write shows in which I try to tell and lecture people. There is not something, that's one thing that I do not want to do because that's the last thing you should ever do to someone that's mm -hmm. doing toxic behavior is try to lecture them. That will get them like shut them down and everything. So I can't write a show saying, don't leave your children, be a good father. Don't be like your dad. No. Um, <laughs> Let me let me turn the spotlight completely on myself. Let me bear the weight of the characters. I'll worry about my care after. Um, but what I then hope happens is that the empathy comes out. And in not having them on the spotlight and not calling them out and not putting people through this, the only thing that they can take in is the story. And the only thing that they might feel is empathy, perhaps for me, but ultimately I hope for themselves in their own situation to realize I'm not alone. Um, because whenever you try to hold a mirror up to the audience, I've, I've always disliked that notion that a playwright should hold up a mirror to the audience because some of us are not narcissists. We don't want to look at the mirror. We don't. But when you hold up the mirror to yourself and you say what you see, the natural impulse, and this might be completely foolish of me to say, but I believe that people are good at their core if you give them the chance to be. And when you say, I don't like what I see, I want the audience to say, what are you talking about? You're good. And it's like, well, then you're saying that about yourself as well. Eventually, when you're saying it of someone else, you start to hopefully realize I'm good too because that person's struggling and they're not judging me. They're not putting this on me. I can now start exploring it myself from the context of just taking the story purely where they're bearing the weight of the story. So for me, whenever I'm exploring this specific kind of stuff that is deeply personal, I need it to be on myself only um, so that the audience does not feel patronized to, they don't feel like they're being lectured at, they don't feel like they're being forced into something, rather they're just taking it in and they see that I will take all the blows in the ring, no one else has to, um, and I'll deal with it later. Um, that's my hope when, when, when dealing with this and that, how I try to care for the, for the audience. Um, they're not getting any hits. They're just watching it. And perhaps the empathy will rise out of their hearts and perhaps they'll have enough to give to themselves as well or to those who they see are struggling with the same thing. I think, I mean, I, I feel like that's also, there's so much of it that for me is also collaborative. Um, and I think the care is, is also collaborative in that way. And it's like, if you, you know, working with a director is probably one of the most crucial elements, uh, like that relationship basically determines how smooth or how bumpy the, the road to bringing a show to life is. Um, and I think that meeting a kindred spirit when it comes to a director is really important. Um, taking that journey together and being on the same page of how the actors are being taken care of and making sure that everybody's checking in with each other and, um, <clears throat> excuse me, I think you learn as you go. Um, and I, and I think that the more, and, and I'll say this for myself, the more that I've done shows, I've, I've learned what it means to work with a director that really understands the purpose of your show and understands why you wrote it. Um, and in that provide, help to provide the care to the actors and to the sound designer and to everyone involved that's bringing a show together, especially if it's a piece that um, that is very emotionally charged. Um, and it could be, you know, good emotionally or bad emotionally charged, depending on the piece, right? Um, but I think that that does have to be a collaborative effort. Um, and it really does come from, I, I take, just like uh, Frankie, I do take a lot of that burden on but I think for me it's also important to have a director that has my back in that way because it's a you know I, I feel that that's a partnership um and again like I, I bring up urban just because 
I love them, but <laughs> but it's also a partnership with the theater. Like it's a, it's a deal that you have with the theater of how this you know, whatever, whichever piece it is, but how this piece is going to be brought to life and therefore how everyone involved is going to be taken care of. Um, and I think that as, especially with the journey that I myself have, have been on as an artist, it's like learning the ways that I can advocate for myself as an artist, but then also advocate for the artists that are working with me to bring um, whatever my vision is to life. Mm -hmm. Totally agree with with Guadalice. The director is um, that is the person that's caring for me. Um, in, in that point, they're, they're the ones that are doing the that that aspect of it. While I take on the rest of the burden, they're the ones looking after me. And that she's completely right. Um, having that relationship where it's a kindred spirit is so so important. I can't I can't second that enough. I feel like one of the ways that all of you take care of the people in your pieces and and the audience that hasn't come up yet is also the balance. You all wrote grief and pain and trauma in, into, your, into your pieces, but there's also laughter and joy and um, it, love. There's also so much positivity. I, and I think that's one of the things that draws me to each of your work too is this sense because it is that spectrum of human experience that makes it feel so honest and so authentic to me that makes me connect so deeply and also that makes it handleable right that that you can take those you can face those more challenging things because you also swing us back and i really appreciate that yeah, yeah. I, I, I found out we, we discovered early on in the plays process, we need to we need a funny moment. Frankie, where's the funny moment? Um, and I'm just like, well, there was this one thing that happened with, with my son where he like tried breastfeeding on me, and he was like, perfect, let's do that. <laughs> and um, and we, adding that in, that was uh, <laughs> the choice to take off my shirt was completely me at that moment. He. <laughs> He wants everyone to know he did not make me take off my shirt, but um, it was, it that needs to be there. I don't think if you have something that's just bleak, 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 you're going to, that's the fastest way to disengage an audience um, straight up. If they don't see my mom going straight abuelita on my little boy when he's born, it's, ay, pero míralo. And it's just like <laughs> that, 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 that really punctures the, the, the weight of the drama. And then when it reinflates, it's that much more impactful. Um, but yeah, you, you need to have some some joy and laughter in that because otherwise it rings false. We don't live a simple life of grief. We don't live a simple life of, of anger and pain. There is joy in there. Um, we wouldn't know what the experience of pain is without the joy. Um, I think it was what well, Lisa said that. Some, someone said it earlier. Um, but yeah, it's, it's absolutely true. It, it, it has to be in there. And it's such a balance too of like, you know, figuring out uh, how to really work it in in a way that feels organic. Um, and I, I personally think a lot of like my own family, like I've seen legit fist fights happen in my family and motherfuckers on the side laughing. I'm like, what are you laughing at? But it's like having to like laugh to be able to process that moment. Like I feel like that that's such a human response. Um, and the ways in which, you know, we create uh, joy out of our pain. I, I don't think humanity would be able to survive if we don't allow ourselves those moments, even if sometimes they are forced. Um, and I think a lot of like, even musically, right? When we look at bachata and merengue and tango and all these forms of joyous music that was created from very oppressed um painful moments of you know black folk in, in in latin america and it's like those things were birthed from these really painful moments but they were needed you know and, it, and it's that's the balance of of life and and it's the balance that's very necessary in storytelling because otherwise i I think Frankie, you said it. It's it would be a very dishonest way of telling a story if it doesn't find the way to balance the moment of joy and the moment of levity and really a moment of breath. Like I find so much joy and respite in sometimes just watching an actor just sit there, not even saying anything, 
just sitting there and inhabiting that character and allowing that character to just exist. And, and there's a subtle beauty in that, that to me, it's like, that's a very human moment. This might be uh, definitely uh, TMI, but um, I was uh, in North Carolina, probably the only time I might actually be in North Carolina, but I was just recently in North Carolina and I got food poisoning. And I was sitting there and I was just with, just like a bunch of normal people, none of them were Latino. And um, I was just like, oh God, I have food poisoning. I hate food poisoning so much. I've had it so many times in my life. And I was like, am I right? And I remember like turning to them and just like, I don't know, wanting them to commiserate with me. And they're like, I've never had food poisoning. And I was like, oh, I guess it's a Latino thing, huh? And no one <laughs> laughed. And I was like, come on, that's so funny. And I'm like throwing up, you know what I mean? And I just think that like, like these, uh, like I think back on the way that, I mean, this humor obviously is a coping mechanism, but laughter just as like true healing. Um, and it's something that like also in terms of language barrier, like it just, it just cuts through kind of all these, um, all these like layers that kind of distance people. It's just some, this laughter just really is like healing and our, and the way that our identity, we can kind of simultaneously like laugh at the pain that we're going through and, and witness it. Or I think about like what those plastic chairs have seen at, um, you know, like cookouts or whatever, like um, just like just different things that we have that I think culturally are really specifically funny um, that maybe aren't for everybody, but, but yeah. Yeah. You gotta have that, that balance. And it's, it's sometimes in the same moment, right? Like sometimes you get that surprise laugh in the absolute depths <laughs> yeah. and that feels so, you know, to actually see that reflected makes you feel like, okay, then when that happens to me, I'm not crazy. I'm not losing it. Mm -hmm. We have a beautiful question here from Melissa Dupre. What kinds of self-care or holistic care practice helps you in your process? What are some kinds you hope your audience has access to? And I think that can tie too to what you were saying, Guadalice, about seeing the theater or producer as a partner as well and asking for those resources. What are What are those things for you? Yeah, and I think a lot of that is very um, specific to the piece. Um, you know, I, I think that a piece, I, I, for me, like for example, Bees and Honey, you know, it, it, it dives into a lot of conversations around, um, you know, machismo and masculinity and, and mental health. And what are the conversations that the theater is creating um, for the audience to be able to have? And whether that's you know in talkbacks, but also in resources and information that the theater provides, and also you know the actors themselves, how the actors are being taken care of um, doing these plays. So I I think it it's very specific to the play itself and curated around the play and the conversation that the play is asking audiences to have um, with the production. If that if that makes sense. And I think there's also something really beautiful about allowing audiences to be part of saying what that could possibly be, um, just because we're also, we all interpret art very differently. Um, and a lot of that could, you know, is from our experiences and our walks through life. And that's one thing that I've been trying to figure out how to be better of incorporating into my art is allowing audiences to also kind of contribute and the, co the community that the art is being, you know, made around and about is contributing into those ways of like, what are ways that for you feel holistically and, you know, and, and I'm also trying to be better about that, whether it's incorporating baths or just being better about rest. But I think it's definitely something that can be uh, a collaborative thing, um, as said before. I think too, just like reaffirming that like, it doesn't have to happen today. That's something that I always get really obsessed with is I have this obsession with time and it's like, like it has to get done by a deadline or these people need it or blah, blah, and it's like, no, 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 it doesn't have to be done today. Like whatever you are trying to finish today can be finished tomorrow. Um, and just removing this, like this mentality of capitalism from the way that we make art specifically in terms of like, payments and deadlines and like i just find that that those are not really 
in con conductive to any type of creativity. So really just trying to offer that grace to myself and then also to the actors or to the artists that I'm working with. And I'm like, yeah, we'll just do it tomorrow. We don't have to stay up until three o'clock in the morning unless we're like really, you know, as a writer, I'm like, oh, I just have to, you know, I have to step and I want to finish this. And that's something that I'm passionate about, but I'm like not really stressing as much about deadlines um, because no matter what, it will get done. Um, so that just offering that grace to everybody that you're in collaboration with and also yourself. Um, yeah. This might sound practical, but water, like you have to make sure you're drinking water. Well, a lot, a lot of water, it helps you. It's an element that helps you clean, you know, and baths are very important when you're working with subject matter that is very traumatic. And yeah, I mean, I, I'm sure you knew this, but. <laughs> I, I second what, what Guadalupe said. Every show is different in terms of how the audience can receive the best care and attention necessary depending on what conversation you're trying to inspire with your show because sometimes not having anything there is the best thing for the audience you know um that 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 is totally a valid thing depending on the show that you're trying to do now i, I know another part of that question was about self-care practices um none of my shows save for one colombian hippo comedy are very happy in terms of their um in terms of their subject so what i try to do for myself personally, is I wake up extremely early. We're talking like 3, 4 a.m. Um, and I walk towards the direction of the sun's rising so that I can actually witness and remind myself that nights end. Um, and that, that that reminder is is so necessary for me to see a dawn. Dawn is something that I um, that is a theme throughout many of my works. I, I, I long to see a dawn after a very long night. Um, I actually prefer winter nights for that reason because nights are very long, much like the sadness that sometimes passes through your soul. But always, no matter what, um, that, that sun's coming up and that sun coming up will be there long after we're gone, long after our children are gone, it will come up. That's It's just the natural way of things. And so I, I practice what I call um, going on this like dusk road to dawn is what I call it to myself, you know, and turning that night journey into something that's beautiful. Yes, the night's coming back. It's cyclical. Of course, it's coming back. But I know that there's a dawn waiting for me after each night um, that I can promise myself. Even in the clouds, dawn's coming. You know, the, So that's what I do for me personally. But for audiences, that that's a conversation with the theater and that's a conversation with the community, really, if you're really about community involvement um, at that level with the theater that you're working with. I just want to add, there's also like this really dope um, movement that I'm seeing from a lot of artists. And this is obviously specifically, I think, for PWIs. I think, you know, theater is like urban. <laughs> uh, theater is like urban theater and, and Aguijon theater, you know, that work specifically closely for communities and, and, and theaters of color. Audiences are allowed to be loud and laugh and, and respond. And, you know, like they're at home watching their telenovelas. That's the exact same way that people in audiences are responding to art. And that in and of itself is is a is a part of healing because you're allowing the person to exist in their in their own body within the art and allow them to, you know, have the experience and have it vocally or have it, you know, in a way that feels the most um, I need to release this now, right? Um, and I feel like that is a beautiful way of taking care of, of audiences and and I remember Dominique Morisot wrote this really beautiful essay where um, she recounted her experience of being in an audience of mostly um, white patrons and her verbally experiencing a play and being told to hush. And that mm -hmm. in and of itself is a traumatic experience because it's like, you're telling someone how to process their feelings of something that they are watching. You know, and I, I do hope that we can get to a point where any audience anywhere is able to watch a work of art and experience it in that moment. I mean, to me, there's nothing beautiful than thinking about my grandmother's watching telenovela and just letting out a <laughs> So like, like freeing that, it's like, that doesn't stay within you. Like you're not keeping that negative energy or, or even keeping that joy inside. You're allowing yourself to freely have this moment and freely have this experience and that expression. And I think that that is, a really beautiful way of taking care of audiences. I totally support that. I'm also so curious now about how we can combine some of these things. Like, 
can we let audiences be responsive in the house and let artists, you know, have that conversation of what they need for their piece? And can we like make sure the audience takes a sip of some water and walks out into the dawn? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I think through self care and, and collective care, I don't think those are necessarily separate. I think we're building a manifesto here. Yeah. <laughs> Lorenzo Gonzalez had a question. After your work, how has your relationship to your trauma changed? Have your thoughts towards the events altered? You, you know, I, I think for me, when I wrote House of Sueños, I was very clear on all the stuff that it was autobiographical. So it's about specifically my depression and my suicide uh, ideation. And I think the biggest thing that changed is just that all of a sudden everyone was looking at me and they were like, whoa, that's what it's like inside your brain. <laughs> I was like, oh my gosh, I wasn't prepared for this. I think that's the that's the part that I didn't quite, because I'm a very new playwright. I've not really written that many plays in, um, in my tenure. So just kind of the, the, the hyper focus on like who you are, even though you're like, no, this is my work. I like to like, this is this is something else. But that to me was just like realizing that a everyone got this really intimate look as to what it feels like inside my brain, uh, the haunted house of my mind. And then the other thing that was really beautiful was just all everyone's reactions to that trauma, like how they were like, oh, that is what it feels like for me. Um, people who like you know, and I'm getting emails from it even today, and just um, the way that it connects with other people. And I've like. I growing up was always like, oh yeah, this is my trauma. This is my burden. I'm not supposed to share it with anybody. I'm gonna keep it till the day that I die and it'll go with me to the grave. Um, and just kind of allowing the the pain to be shared um, in order to be released, I think is something that I've really experienced from, from writing, that there's a part of you that you almost get to like, just, it no longer is hidden. Like you just sit with it at the table every day, that your grief and your trauma gets to share dinner with you, gets to go to the movies with you. It gets to be public in a way that I had not ever allowed it to be public. Um, and now there's, I think, even more of an understanding when I'm having an anxiety attack or a depressive episode, just the freedom to communicate that so that the personality, I think, that people see in terms of me, me being like funny and outgoing and everything's great kind of starts to match with the personality that I keep inside. And so that there's just a lot more care, I think, from, from everyone. I think my own personal relationship to my trauma has shifted in a way that I look at depression now, not as something that comes over me and rules over everything that I do, but rather as a negotiation. I have come to the conclusion that I need to take as many happy experiences, experiences as possible with my child, with my family, in my own just pursuit of art and take all of that in so that I can have that almost as a kind of payment when that tax collector of my joy comes for me <laughs> and be able to show you're wrong. I have proof here that you're wrong. This is actual proof, whether that's memories, whether that's pay stubs, whether that's little certificates of awards or whatever it may be. I now realize that everything is not absolute um, and that these things are not sovereign over me. My father is not sovereign over my future um, in terms of how I'm going to approach fatherhood. My sadness, my inner pain is not something that will dominate everything because I've shown I can beat it. Uh, and it's always, it's always up for negotiation whether or not I allow it to take more from me than I'm willing to give. Um, it can't if I don't want it to. And it's a, it's a battle. This is not to say don't do therapy. Yes, therapy, <laughs> please, uh, and seek the help as as necessary. But yeah, that's that's how I've I've reframed my my trauma. Is that it's a negotiation now? How the trauma affects me and how the trauma will affect others. And um, if that means making wagers with myself, that is my motivation. Oh shoot! Don't put me in a horse track. I will be there. <laughs> don't, don't, don't let me play the lotto. Like I'll buy a hundred tickets. I am, I'm that fool. Um, but yeah, you know, that's, that's how I look at it now. Um, in terms of after the work, I see it now as always a negotiation, always a wager and never an absolute. It's always up in the air. Hmm. 
have this question from Sylvia. That's a very so, tough question. Um, yeah. <laughs> asks, how do you move through rehearsal when the material is still so fresh or painful, but there are deadlines to be met? How do you honor both the reality of your mental health and commitment to yourself and others? I think it's important that we just acknowledge and somebody said this earlier in the discussion too, I think maybe it was quite at least that especially our kind of traditional Western structures make a lot of assumptions and they are not built. The, the container is not built to hold the full human experience. It is absolutely bound by certain capitalist, colonialist, white supremacist ideas about time and resource and um limit limitation thinking right um and i understand that we we are in that construct and it doesn't always feel like you have the freedom to just i loved what you said Meme, about liberating yourself from that deadline but i also understand that you know people artists need to survive you need those relationships sometimes to get that next gig right yeah I personally feel if this is something that is a contract or this is an agreement that I've made with an artistic space, they should know me well enough and our relationship should be such that they understand that they're going to be roadblocks. Um, when it's coming to things like I'm not going to meet the deadline because of the rawness of the material, it's now time to put your liberal values at work here and um, say, yeah, I understand. Let me give you that space. But if we're going to talk about the deadline, that's not very uh, open minded, in my opinion. And that's where, you know, I it's kind of putting that, that that test to the other person. Is this a transactional relationship or is this a working relationship? And we are always trying to figure out a way to make it work. I do understand deadlines. I understand that, yeah, we need our check. But if the relationship with the producing organization, the producer or whoever we're trying to meet this deadline for, is a good one, then this is something that they should understand. Hey, this is raw. This is tough for me. And I need a little bit of an extension. And if they care, if they truly care, they will they will honor that and they will try to find a way to make it work. Uh, and as much as I, I sympathize uh, with, oh, no, now we have to change our season lineup or no, we have to find a new replacement show. It can be done. It has been done. Um, and it's been done for much more mild reasons. It could be just because of playwrights blocking the rights, even though you planned it out for your season. It just happens. So I think it really depends on your relationship. But in terms of the rawness of the material, you just have to meet it. And if it's if it's at that moment too much during the rehearsal, you have to honor that. Whenever your body and soul are telling you something, to not listen is to cause yourself injury in the same way that an athlete injures themselves by playing through pain. Um, and then they end up with problems for the rest of their life. You have to you have to acknowledge that you as an artist are also an athlete and you have a spiritual fitness, a mental fitness that you need to take care of. And in rehearsal, just like in, you know, a boxing practicing gym or something like that, if you're pushing yourself too hard, you're going to screw up, screw it up, but you're going to injure yourself and then you can't even go into the match. <laughs> you know, just meet yourself, be kind to yourself and say, OK, it's not happening today. You know, um, I need to rest. I, I need to go watch cat videos on YouTube. I need to do something else except for this. And a producing organization or someone that's trying to enforce a deadline, they should be understanding and cognizant of that if what they say is not just lip service that they're paying to try to keep the whatever fake cancel thing that they think exists away from them, which doesn't exist. But yeah, um, that's that would be my thoughts is, is on, yeah. I think uh, a lot of what you're saying, Frankie, for me rings really true. Um, you know, even even with an organization that your relationship is new um, and, and the relationship and the theater, the organization doesn't know you and you don't know the organization. I think there are, I, I think at the most basic level, you're your own best advocate. And we've talked a lot about this before, but understanding what your process and what you need is so important. And communicating that with the organization is very important. And whether you're doing it, you know, yourself or it's through your agent, 
And, and if it's through your agent, that's also a relationship that needs to be on the same, <laughs> on the same page. It isn't always. Um, but if you have, you know, an agent that like that understands you and is constantly checking in with you and making sure that, you know, you're being taken care of and that they're facilitating ways of taking care of you and then communicating that with the theater, like it's it, it's a perfect synergistic relationship. And I, I think that ultimately the ideal and I know that things aren't always ideal because things happen. That's just, you know, humanity. But the ideal is that you walk already into a space and you know what you need, you know what your pro you have a process of taking care of yourself and you're able to communicate that with the organization. And there is this understanding of what is needed to help bring this world that you are writing to life. Um, and, I, you know, it, it's, it's different for everyone. Right. And I, I know for myself, it's depending on how many projects I'm working at the time, I'm very transparent with organizations that approach me about work. I say, this is also what I have going on. And then it's like, okay, then let's adjust the deadlines accordingly so that we're able to kind of make sure that we're not putting too much on you and that the work that you're gonna, you know, provide with provide us with is work that you are happy about and that you're comfortable with. And that is also able to meet what, you know, visions we've spoken about um, for the piece. And I, I think that that's so important. And I've seen a lot of artists and and I and I've done it myself where I don't fully communicate and so it's like it becomes a little bit disastrous um mm -hmm. so I think advocating for yourself and the things that you need is the most important um thing and and also knowing what it is that you need I feel like one thing too really fast is just like it's it's gonna take more time more vocabulary more 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 to be more accessible uh accessibility just like i feel like sometimes when i think about like if the easy emotion for me to experience is anxiety or fear or depression that just sweeps right in it knows me it's like an old blanket that just comes on and i think for the theater world it's easy to go back to these like unaccess inaccessible um racist capitalistic white supremacist ways of making art and i think that it it takes more time and more money and more patience and more understanding to be more accessible so when you're working with playwrights who have it, who are writing about trauma, who are experiencing trauma, or playwrights who have mental health challenges or processing grief or sorrow, it just takes more time, and it takes more patience and more love. Um, and I, you know, just because that's the that's that that's the that's the place that we're headed. I think you know. I even I think the pandemic really kind of shifted into focus this idea of accessibility and needs and communicating those things. And I used to not be someone who was, I was not very good at it, but when I'm having a depressive episode, I you know can't get out of bed. So it's like, the place not gonna write itself, you know? Um, but just being able to communicate and being able to listen to those things, I think is really important. I don't know if this is good or bad, but I've always just worked through it. <laughs> I, I, I don't think I knew that I had a choice or maybe I just, just took it as a challenge and every time i've had a moment where i feel like i don't know or it's too big for me i i i've just done it like just go through it as a challenge to myself and to the mental strength that i trust that i have i mean i have i don't know i but i also understand what you're all saying because you're you're writing very you know personal subject matters <laughs> i don't know the night before i did uh we did uh silencio i went looking one by one all the women that had been murdered in puerto rico in the past three years and how they had been murdered and the all the accounts in the newspaper and it was appalling and horrendous and all of it you can imagine um i don't know i just think sometimes through is actually healing sometimes you also find answers <laughs> and i maybe it takes a toll on you i don't know i don't think there's a right and wrong it's so beautiful to hear this range of responses and i want to honor what all of you have offered and shared and i think we've all been in all of those spaces May we be ever more graceful with ourselves and with others and just create those spaces where we wanna be in and those partnerships we wanna work in. 
Y'all, we are at our time and this I could continue this conversation forever. I wanna say a huge thank you to each of our panelists for the robust discussion. Thank you for bringing your artistry and your humanity to the Encuentro. Thank you for your pieces, um, that are, that are your shows. If you, like me, wish that this conversation could keep going, please continue it in the lounge. And then at 6 p.m. Pacific time, the next show is House of Dust. This one is amazing, y'all, as well. Please check it out. Uh, Meme, Guadalese, Frankie, Marta, thank you so, so much. Thank you. To our ASL interpreters, thank you. Thank yes. you. Thank you. You all are incredible. <laughs> and to everyone out there, have a fantastic evening. Please enjoy. Ciao. Ciao. <laughs>